Good day and welcome to the final lecture presentation in Management Accounting. As you know, Management Accounting is all about providing us with the relevant tools and techniques that will help us to assist the management and ourselves to make informed judgments and decisions. This topic is about capital budgeting decisions, chapter 16 of your textbook. Decisions, decisions, why are they so important? Well, decisions determine destiny. And as we make our choices, we also choose the consequences. This is why I'd like to open this presentation with a verse from Joshua 24 verse 15. Joshua, the servant of God, is appealing to his people before they enter the promised land. And this is what he said. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, as we end this semester with this topic, we pray, O oh Lord, that we will make the right decision and choose you to be our leader so that we will be guided by you in every situation that we face. Thank you, Father, for giving Jesus to us, for the Holy Spirit who is always there to guide us. May the Holy Spirit dwell in each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this topic, we are going to have five learning objectives. And there are quite a few terms that you will encounter in this topic. Terms like net present value, NPV, internal rate of return, IRR, discounted cash flow, DCF, and payback as well as accounting rate of return. Now, before we dive in to the learning objectives, I'd like to introduce you to what capital budgeting entails. Capital budgeting is the process used by managers to choose among alternative investment opportunities that have cash flows spanning over a number of years. That means long term. Now, there are four capital budgeting methods that we will consider. The first two, net present value and internal rate of return, NPV and IRR, consider the time value of money, whilst the last two, payback method and accounting rate of return, do not consider the time value of money. Under the NPV method, we determine whether the firm would be better off investing in a project based on the net amount of all discounted cash flows for the project received over the project's lifetime. How do we calculate the NPV? It is simply the present value of all future cash flows minus the initial capital expenditure or the initial cash outflows. So the NPV will give you the dollar figure. Internal rate of return, on the other hand, is computed by finding the discount rate that will cause the NPV of the project to be zero. So the IRR is a percentage. Payback method, on the other hand, calculates how quickly the project will pay for itself. So it is in the form of the number of years. It measures how long will it take for the company to recoup its initial investment. So one thing with payback method is that it ignores any cash flows that the company will receive after the investment has been recovered. The accounting rate of return 
focuses on the incremental accounting income that results from a project. So the accounting rate of return is also in percentage. It is similar to your rate of return or the return on investment. Now, what do we mean by discounted cash flow analysis? Well, when we are using DCF analysis, that means we need to account for the time value of money in the decision to be made. So what exactly is the time value of money? To understand the time value of money, we need to know the difference between the future value as well as the present value. So future value refers to the amount of money an investment will grow over some period of time at some given interest rate. And this future value is the cash value of an investment at some time in the future. So if, for example, I have $1 today and I am intending to invest it and get a return of 10%. So you can see here a future value of $1 table, right? If I invest $1 at 10%, that means at the end of one year, I would have earned 10%. So that means the future value of $1 today, one year later is $1.10. Now, if I continue to invest that $1, by the end of year two, it would have grown to $1.21. By the end of year three, it will be $1.331. So you can see that as the number of years the money is invested continues, the future value of that money will increase accordingly. So $1 today will be worth more than money that I will receive in the future, all right? Because it can grow. That's why there is a time value for money. Now, the present value, on the other hand, is the current value of future cash flows discounted at the appropriate discount rate. So the present value attempts to answer what is the value of some future amount or cash flows today. So present value is really the opposite of what we are discussing earlier, because when we calculate the present value of future cash flows, we are discounting that future cash flow. So here, let's go back to the 10% discount rate. If I was promised to receive $1.10 at the end of the year, and I would like to know what is the present value of that $1.10, because it's a future cash flow, right? I would like to know the value of that future cash flow today. So what I'm going to do is to discount that future value. And so $1.10 at the end of the year, at 10% interest rate will have a present value of how much? It should be $1. And we can actually refer to another table, present value of $1. So notice that we are going to use the discount rate to calculate the present value of some future amount of cash flows. All right. Which one do you think has a bigger value? Is it the future cash flows or money that you already have now? Well, you can see from here that if we are to calculate the present value of $1, say at the end of one year. So if you are talking about $1 that you will receive one year from today, at 10%, the present value of that $1 is only 90.9 .9 cents. And if you're going to receive $1 10 years from today, 
what is the discounted value or the present value of that $1 10 years from today at the discount rate of 10%? Well, you can see that it's only 0.386. All right, so 38.6 cents. So the further into the future you would receive the money, the smaller the value of that money would be. And that's what we mean by discounting or discounted cash flow analysis. Now we are ready to go to learning objective one. Evaluate an investment proposal using the NPV method and the IRR method. We'll consider this example from Matson Company. The company has been offered a five-year contract to provide component parts for a large manufacturer. We are provided here with cost and revenue information and it says that at the end of five years, the working capital will be released and may be used elsewhere by the company. The company uses a discount rate of 10% and we are asked whether this contract should be accepted. So the first thing that we need to do is to calculate the net annual cash inflows for the company. We are told that sales revenue from parts is 750,000 and the cost of parts sold is 400,000. So we'll deduct 400 from 750,000 and we'll get a gross margin of 350,000. Then we will deduct the other out-of-pocket costs like salary, shipping, and others, 270000 So the annual net cash inflows is 80000 That is for each year, from year one to year five. We can now prepare a table to calculate the present value of these cash flows. Now, first, we will determine what cash outflows or investments we will have at the beginning of the contract. We'll call that year zero or right now. So the investment in equipment of 160000 and the working capital required will be cash outflows at year zero or right now. The present value factor at year zero is always one. And so the present value of those will be exactly 160,000 and 100,000 respectively. For the annual net cash inflows that we have calculated earlier at 80,000, we'll be receiving that uniform cash inflows at each year from year one to year five. And for us to calculate the present value of that, we will need to use the present value of a series of $1 cash flows. So that is also known as the present value of an annuity. Here we are told that the interest rate used is 10% and this will be for five years. So 10% at the end of five years will have a present value of an annuity factor of 3.791. So we'll multiply 3.791 by 80,000 and we'll get 303,280. Now the relining equipment of 30,000 will be in three years. So that would be incurred at the end of year three and that is 30,000. We will now need to discount that at 10% at the end of three years. So that is 0.751, all right? So 30,000 times 0.751 is 22,530. That's also a cash outflow. That's why it's negative. Now at the end of year five, we will have a salvage value of $5,000. So that is an inflow. And we will again consult the present value table at 10% at the end of year five would be 0.621. That is the 
present value factor. So we will multiply 5,000 times 0.621 and that would give us 3,105. The working capital will be released at the end of the contract and therefore considered an inflow. So at the end of year five, we will again use the present value factor of 0.621 times 100,000 that would give us 62,100. So when we total up all the present value of inflows and deduct the present value of cash outflows, we get the net present value of $85,955. So what will be our recommendation? Well, the company should accept the contract because the present value of the cash inflows exceeds the present value of the cash outflows by $85,955. So the project has a positive NPV and therefore acceptable. Whenever the NPV is negative, then we will reject the project. Let's now move to IRR. Now recall that IRR is that discount rate that will cause the net present value to be zero. So IRR is the true economic return earned by the asset over its life. Let us have a look at this example. Black company can purchase a new machine at a cost of 104320 that will save the company $20,000 per year in cash operating costs. The machine has a 10-year life. Notice here that future cash flows are the same every year in this example. So we can calculate the IRR as follows. We'll divide the investment required by the net annual cash flows and that would give us the PV factor, the present value factor. So 104,320 is the investment required and the annual cash flow is 20,000. That's the savings. So that would give us 5.216. Now that is not the IRR. That is the present value factor. So what we need to do is to look at the table and scan the 10 period row because it is for 10 year period, right? And then we will look accordingly and see that we are able to find the present value factor of 5.216. Then we will look up what is that rate pertaining to that PV factor. And we can see that it is 14% here. All right, now let us check whether 14% is really the rate that will give us the zero NPV. So let's check it out. The investment required right now is 104,320. So we'll multiply that by the PV factor of one. The annual cost savings for years one to 10 is $20,000. What is the PV factor for 14% at 10 years is 5.216. So if you multiply 20,000 by 5.216, you'll get exactly 104,320. And therefore, the net present value is zero. As such, we can say that 14% is indeed the internal rate of return. All right. Let's move on to learning objective two. Here we'll compare the NPV and the IRR methods and we'll discuss the assumptions that underlie each method. Under NPV, the cost of capital is used as the actual discount rate. Any project with a negative NPV will be rejected. Under the IRR method, the cost of capital is compared to the internal rate of return on a project. In order for us to decide whether the project is acceptable, a project's rate of return must be greater than the cost 
of capital. So remember in the example we have calculated that the IRR is 14%. If the cost of capital is only 10%, then we should accept this project. It will be profitable. But if our cost of let's say borrowing will be 18%, and the IRR is only 14%, then we should not accept the project because it will make a loss. All right. The net present value method has the following advantages over the IRR method. Firstly, NPV is easier to use. And secondly, it's easier to adjust for risk. All you have to do is perhaps increase your discount rate in order for you to adjust for the level of risk or uncertainty that you might face when you are calculating future cash flows. With IRR, you can't really do that. All right. What are the assumptions underlying the discounted cash flow analysis? Remember that both NPV and IRR consider the time value of money. Therefore, both use discounted cash flow analysis. So here are the assumptions underlying DCF analysis. Number one, we assume that all cash flows are treated as though they occur at the end of the year. Even though some of the cash inflows might be received at the end of the second month or the first quarter or the first half of the year, we assume that it will be received at the end of the year. Second assumption, we are assuming that a perfect capital market exists. We also treat cash flows as if they are known with certainty. But if we have to be realistic, we know that cash flows are uncertain. And finally, it is assumed in DCF analysis, that cash inflows are immediately reinvested at the required rate of return. Now, it is very likely that there are no plausible investment opportunities for which you can reinvest the cash inflows. And so in that regard, this assumption might not be very realistic. Now, when choosing the hurdle rate or the discount rate, this rate is generally associated with the company's cost of capital. Now, the cost of capital involves a blending of the costs of all sources of capital. It may be from the equity or it could be from debt. All right, let's go to learning objective three. Here, we'll understand the difference between the total cost approach and the incremental cost approach to evaluate investment proposals. So when comparing two investment projects, what we need to do is to use either the total cost approach or the incremental cost approach. Under the total cost approach, we use all of the relevant costs of each proposal and we include this in the net present value analysis. Under the incremental cost approach, on the other hand, we only use the difference in the cost of the two competing alternative. So let's have a look at this example. We are considering whether to use the mainframe or to use the PC, personal computers. The costs as well as the savings are provided here. We are told that each system would last five years and the hurdle rate or the discount rate is 12% for the analysis. So let us use the total cost approach first. If we use the mainframe, we are told that we will have the cost of 400,000 at year zero and the acquisition cost of software is 40,000. There will be a system update needed by year three and the salvage value is 50,000 at the end of year five. 
Now, the operating cost, we've been told, is 335000 So, we'll assume that that will be happening at the end of each year, year one to five. Time-sharing revenue of 20000 is also uniform from years one to five. So, we can total up the cash flows and then multiply this by the discount factor of course at year zero the discount factor is one at year one it will be 0.893 at the hurdle rate of 12 percent and 0.797 for year two and so forth and so on you can get this from the table as we have shown earlier so we can see that the present value of mainframe is negative $1,575,705. We'll do the same for personal computer. We will calculate how much will be the cash flow in year zero and the cash flows for year one to five. And we'll again multiply that by the present value factor at the hurdle rate or discount rate of 12%. So we get the sum of the present values being 1,247,885. So if we purchase the mainframe system, the net cost will be 1,575,705. And if we purchase the personal computer system, it will be 1,247,885. And therefore, the net present value of the cost is 327820 So, what should the company choose in this sense? Well, they should purchase the personal computer system because they can save $327,820. Now, let's consider the incremental costing approach. Here, we will use just the difference between mainframe and PC. So in year one, the acquisition cost for the mainframe is 400,000, whereas for PC is 300,000. So the difference is 100,000. For the cost of software, it's 40,000 for mainframe and 75,000 for PC. So we have a difference of 35,000. Then at the end of year three, the system update will be 40 and 60,000 difference of 20,000. The salvage value also has a difference of 50 minus 30,000 is 20,000. All right. In terms of the operating cost, we get a difference of 100,000. How did we get that? For the mainframe, the total of personal maintenance and other cost is 335,000. For PC, the total is 235,000. So there is a difference of 100,000. More for mainframe, so we've got it as negative here. Then data link services are the same for both alternatives so we will ignore that for revenue from timeshare mainframe has a positive 20,000 none for pc so again we will consider that because it's different among the alternatives so now we can total up the cash flows and then we will multiply it by the discount factor at the hurdle rate of 12%. So we will be able to get the sum of the present values at $327,820. So now we can compare the two methods. Under the total cost approach, the net present value of cost is 327820 and under the incremental cost approach, we get the same figure. So different methods, but the same result. If I were to choose between the two, I would prefer the incremental cost approach because it is simpler, but it will just be according to your choice. 
Now, what is the management accountant's role in capital budgeting? Well, of course, the management accountant will be more likely to calculate the net present value, the IRR, and the like. But more than that, management accountants are often asked to predict the cash flows that relate to, for example, the operating cost savings, the additional working capital requirements, as well as the incremental costs and revenues. When cash flow projections are very uncertain, the accountant will have to use his or her own professional judgment. And as a result, it may be that the accountant might increase the discount rate or the hurdle rate in order for the risk to be taken into account. Accountants can also use sensitivity analysis. This is also known as the what if analysis. So what if the economy is improving? It's likely that we may be able to get more cash flow so we could use perhaps a lower hurdle rate. But if the cost of the capital will be higher because of inflation, then the discount rate to be used will have to be higher. There is normally a need for post audit of the investment projects. So a post audit is a follow up after the project has been approved to see whether or not the expected results are actually realized. Let's now move on to learning objective four. Here, we will determine the after-tax cash flows in investment analysis and evaluate an investment proposal using a discounted cash flow analysis and will give full consideration to income tax issues. So how do taxes affect capital budgeting. When a business makes a profit, it usually must pay income taxes just like individuals. Since much of cash flows associated with an investment proposal affect the company's profit, they also affect the firm's income tax liability. Any aspect of an investment project that affects any of the items in this equation generally will affect the company's income tax payments. So the equation is something very familiar to us. Income is equal to revenue minus expenses plus any gains minus any losses. These income tax payments are cash flows and they must be considered in any discounted cash flow analysis. So let's talk about non-cash expenses. Note that not all expenses represent cash outflows. The most common example of a non-cash expense is guess what? Depreciation expense. There could also be amortization expense for intangible assets. Now, the annual depreciation expense provides a reduction in income tax expense equal to the firm's tax rate times the depreciation deduction. So this is called a depreciation tax shield. In a DCF analysis, the related cash flows which occurs over a period of years are discounted to get the present value. So here is an example. Let's consider high country department stores, which operates two department stores in the city of Mountain View. The firm has a large downtown store and a smaller branch store in the suburbs. The company is quite profitable and management is considering several capital projects that will enhance the firm's future profit potential. So suppose High Country's management is considering the purchase of an additional delivery truck. High Country will then consider the after-tax cash flows from the incremental sales revenue and expenses 
in order to assist in their decision making. So let's say the incremental sales revenue net of the cost of goods sold, which will be cash inflow, is $50,000. The incremental tax, which is a cash outflow, will be 50,000 times the tax rate. So the tax rate, let's say, is given at 30%. So that means the incremental income tax would be negative 15,000. That's a cash outflow. Therefore, the after tax cash flow, which is the net inflow after taxes, will be $35,000. Now, there is a quicker method of computing the after tax cash inflow from incremental sales. All you have to do is to multiply 50,000 times 1 minus the tax rate. So 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7. So 0.7 times 50,000 is $35,000. That's the after-tax cash inflow. If we're calculating the after-tax cash outflow, let's say the incremental expense, which is the cash outflow, is 30000 Now, if we calculate 30000 times the tax rate, that would be 9000 So our after-tax cash outflow will be reduced from 30000 to 21000 So the quicker method to calculate this after-tax cash flow is to multiply again the 30,000 by 1 minus the tax rate. So that would be 30,000 times 0.7 equals $21,000. All right, so now let us move to the final learning objective for this topic and for the semester. We'll evaluate capital investment projects using the payback method and the accounting rate of return. So remember, payback method calculates the number of years it takes for the company to recoup its investment. So when the cash inflows are uniform, the payback period will be easier to calculate. We could use this formula, initial investment divided by the annual after-tax cash inflow. So Let's say a company can purchase a machine for $20,000 and they will have annual cash inflows of 4000 for seven years. To calculate the payback, we'll just divide $20,000 by 4000 the annual cash inflow, and we'll get five years. So... What are the advantages of the payback method? Well, for one thing, it provides a tool for roughly screening the investments. If you have a number of investments, you would choose, of course, the projects that will have the shorter payback because the shorter the payback, the more you can reinvest those money quicker. Another advantage of payback method is that for some firms, it may be essential that an investment recover its initial cash outflows as quickly as possible. However, in terms of the disadvantages of payback method, well, we've already mentioned that it fails to consider the time value of money for one thing, and for another, it doesn't consider the project's cash flows beyond the payback period. All right, so now let us consider accounting rate of return method. You may recall that this method focuses on the incremental accounting income that results from a project. Now, in this method, accounting income is based on accrual accounting procedures. That's why we also call this accrual accounting rate of return. So what do we know about accrual accounting? Well, under accrual accounting, revenue is recognized during the period of sale, not necessarily when the cash is received. Also, expenses are recognized during the period they are incurred not necessarily when they are paid in cash. So the following formula is used to calculate the accrual accounting rate of return. 
AARR is equal to the average incremental revenues minus the average incremental expenses, including depreciation and taxes, divided by the initial investment. So here is an example. Myers company wants to install an espresso bar in its restaurant. The espresso bar cost 140000 and it has a 10-year life. It will generate incremental revenues of $100,000 and incremental expenses of $80,000, including depreciation. So what is the accounting rate of return for this investment project? So we'll apply the formula. Accounting rate of return is equal to the average incremental revenues of 100000 minus the average incremental expenses, including depreciation and taxes. So that is 80000 divided by the initial investment of 140000 and that gives us 14.3%. So if our cost of capital is 10%, then it is worth investing. But if our cost of capital is greater than 14.3%, then we should not invest in this espresso bar. All right, so let us now look at this illustrative example, which will require us to calculate the NPV, IRR, AARR, and the payback period, all the four capital budgeting techniques that we have learned. So we are told that Amaro Hospital is a not-for-profit entity that is not subject to income taxes. It is considering the purchase of new equipment costing $20,000 to achieve cash savings of $5,000 per year in operating costs. The estimated useful life is 10 years with no salvage value. We are told that the minimum expected return is 14%. So let us calculate the NPV of this investment. First, let us look at the present value factor at 14% for 10 years. So we can see that it is 5.216. So now we can calculate the net present value. First, the cost of the equipment, 20,000, will be incurred at year zero. Therefore, it will have a present value of 20,000 and it will be negative. All right. Then we'll add the cash savings of 5,000 per year. So in order for us to calculate the present value of this 5,000 annual cash inflow, we'll need to multiply that by the present value factor of an annuity because this is uniform cash flow from years 1 to 10. At what rate? 14% 10 years. So we will multiply that with the present value factor of annuity of 5.216 and we will get 26,080. Then now we can calculate the net present value as the difference between 26,080 and 20,000. So we have a positive NPV of 6,080, which means that this equipment investment proposal is acceptable. Let's go to requirement letter B. What is the IRR? So to calculate the IRR, we'll need to divide the initial outlay of 20,000 by the annual cash savings of 20000 because it is a uniform cash inflow of 5000 for 10 years. What we'll get is a factor of 4. We will now consult the present value of annuity table and hover around the 10-year period and you will see from here that 4 is very close to just over 20% with the PVFA present value factor of annuity of 4.192. So we can say that IRR is just above 20%. Let's now go to requirement C. What's the 
accrual accounting rate of return based on the initial investment. So to calculate the AARR, we will assume that there will be a straight line method of depreciation. So the earnings will be calculated as follows. 5,000 as given here minus the depreciation of 20,000, the initial cost of the equipment divided by 10 years. So that would give us 2,000 annual depreciation. And therefore, the annual earnings would be 5,000 minus 2,000, $3,000. Then we can calculate the AARR simply as the return every year of 3,000 divided by the investment of 20,000 and that would give us 15% accounting rate of return. Finally, what is the payback period? So to calculate the payback period, again, we have uniform cash savings. So we'll just divide the initial investment of 20,000 by the cash inflow every year of 5,000 and we'll see that we have a payback of four years. So it would take four years before the hospital can get back its investment. Well, that is it for this lecture. I would like to end with this quote from Ellen G. White. She said, we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Isn't that amazing? We have nothing to fear for the future except we forget how God has led us. I would also like to share this final appeal by the Apostle Paul to the Philippians, which is so applicable to us. He said, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We should fill our minds with all these positive ways of thinking. And in verse 9, it says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you are a God of love. We have come to the final topic for this course, and we are so grateful, O oh Lord, that we have learned quite a lot, but more importantly, I pray that each one of us would have learned how to trust in you fully and to let you be the guide in our lives, to put you in the driving seat of our lives so that everything and every choice that we make will be in accordance to your will. May the Holy Spirit dwell among each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, this is it for the final topic, but please don't forget to do your post-lecture required activities, and I will see you in class shortly. Bye-bye for now. God bless.